Grace and peace to you this day. Welcome to Worship at Park Church. My name is Caleb Saddam. I'm the pastor here. I'm glad to be with you here this morning. As we prepare to worship God, let us hear these words from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore, we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, and with all our soul, and with all our might. Let us worship the, the God who renews us and reforms us. Let us pray. Loving God, we have gathered to meet you. We have come to listen to you, to seek you, and to worship you. You are the beginning of all things, the life of all things. You knew us before we knew, before we were born. In you we become, in you we live. Loving God, you are here and everywhere, around us and within us. You know our inmost thoughts. In you we hope, in you we live. You are the source of serenity, giving peace that is beyond our understanding. In you we are still, in you we live. Loving God, we live in you, we worship you. Loving God, you live in us, and we worship you. Amen. Friends, Scripture tells us that if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting in God's great mercy, let us now confess our sins before God and one another, first in our unison prayer and then in a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, we often say that we love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But when we look closely at our lives, we confess that our hearts are full of concerns that are not your concerns. Our souls are neglected. You are barely on our minds, and our strength is depleted by things that do not have anything to do with you. Please forgive our sin. Cleanse us. Renew us. Reform us. Make us ever new. We ask this in the name of the one who died to set us free, Jesus the Christ. Amen. May We may not keep our promises to God, but God's promises to us never fail. Friends, let us rejoice that because of God's great faithfulness, we have been forgiven. Amen. And before we go to the word of God read and proclaimed, let us first go to God in prayer. Loving God, send your Holy Spirit to enliven us, to open our ears to your word, to have us be changed by your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, our, uh, our reading today may be familiar to some folks. Uh, this, is one, this is one of those verses that just kind of makes it out uh, into uh, the general, um, what am I looking for? It just kind of makes it out there into the culture. You may have even seen signs and stuff with this printed on it. This is, again, from the book of Hebrews, continuing our little jaunt through Hebrews, from chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Listen now for the word of God. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Coming up on our next, our next sermon of, uh, on the book of Hebrews, which is itself a sermon to a tired church. And... Um, and what binds us together as a congregation is our faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that's one of the very few statements about Christianity that is undisputed. There are differences of interpretation and opinion about pretty much everything else in Christianity, uh, but this group is brought together solely because of our shared faith in Jesus Christ. Faith can unite. Faith can give us the confidence to continue on in the face of adversity, and faith can move us to do new and remarkable things. The preacher, the author of the book of Hebrews, gives his famous, if rather simplistic, definition of 
Faith is much more than just what he says here, but, but this is a pretty useful definition to keep in your back pocket. You know, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And you know, that conviction of things not seen is, is even more to the point for me when, when you're really getting down to the, the basics of, of, of having faith in something, uh, having faith in, in, in God, rather. Uh, we are convinced of the reality of something that there is absolutely no empirical proof for. The existence of God cannot be proven. It can't be disproven. It cannot be proven. There is no way to observe God. There's no way to measure God. Uh, there is no way to examine the properties of God, the way that we can observe the solids, liquids, and, and gases that surround us on earth, like and my, my stole, right? You can, you can observe this. You can see it with your eyes. You can, you, you can measure it. You can measure its, its weight, its, its volume, its, its dimensions, its, its, its width, its length. We cannot do that with, with God. There is no absolute proof of God. And, and, and despite all that, we still become convinced of God's existence, or at least convinced enough that we still have faith. It may not be 100%, we may still have doubt, but ultimately those that are bound together, that are part of the church, and those who are not part of the church, who are not part of a congregation yet still believe, they can't shake this certainty of one degree or another that God does exist. There have been many times in my life where I had to, con where I seemingly tried to convince myself that God did not exist. I, I, was, I was trying to just completely walk away and say, no, this is, this is just, this is all crud. Um, you know, I, and, and largely these were brought about, brought about by times of saying, look, there is no absolute proof of God. And that led me down this path of wanting to be rid of this. But despite all the evidence, or rather lack of evidence of God, and, and, and despite my, my uh, apparent will to disbelieve, I could not say that I didn't believe God exists. There is no objective proof of God, but I cannot say that I do not see the hand of God at work in my life. And while my experience of God is not sufficient proof for anyone but me, for me, that experience of the unseen God makes all the difference. Now, to talk about something that seems totally unrelated, translation is a tricky business. When translating a text from, from one language to another, it, it's not an exact science, as much as we would rather, as much as we would prefer that it would be. And there are often many possible ways to translate any given word, and, and it's up to the translators to make the determination that they feel is best. And, and, and having some, some experience working with the original languages of the scriptures, sometimes there can be a half a dozen words, half a dozen possible words to translate a word in the original biblical texts of, of Hebrew and Greek. And oftentimes when translating the original language, the Bible was written into the Hebrew and Greek, translating that from those original languages to a language that, you know, people still speak here in the world, uh, choices sometimes get made that end up not being the best choices. This reading contains uh, one example of a translation that I don't believe to be uh, the best possible translation of this, uh, of one particular word uh, in, in, this, in the first verse. And the, that word that we're talking about here is the word that is translated here as assurance. And that assurance comes in the sentence, assurance of things hoped for. Now, that, uh, that word assurance, the, the, the Greek word that is translated assurance, it was used earlier in the book of Hebrews. It was, and it was translated the very being. And that happened in, earlier in the book in, the, in chapter 1 where the preacher was saying that Jesus was the very being of God. 
Now, now this changes this reading today dramatically. Not just the assurance of things hoped for, but the very being of things hoped for. I, I think the translation in the Common English Bible translation uh, hits far closer to the mark. It says, faith is the reality of what is hoped for. Faith itself is reality. It's not an indication of something. It's not a, a, an assurance of something. It is, it is reality. That's a truly extraordinary thing. It's an extraordinary statement to be making. Faith isn't simply a belief. It's, it's the reality that God has taken up residence in you. Through faith, the reality of the kingdom of God comes into this world right here and now. And the rest of chapter 11 is the retelling of well, the, the brief kind of synopsis of stories of some of the big figures in the Old Testament and, and what they did because of their faith, because they had faith. Noah had faith and built the ark at God's urging. And, and even though it didn't look like he needed a big boat just then, he built it on faith, on faith in God. Faith that when God said, build this boat, God knew what was happening. When God knew what God was talking about and knew the future world that, he wanted, that God wanted Noah to participate in. Abraham had faith and it led him to leave his homeland and, and believe that he would have children, even in his old age when he and his wife had not been able to have children uh, their whole life through. Generations and generations later, Moses had faith to rise against the king of Egypt because God had promised that his people would be set free. And, and he did this even when he looked around and Moses saw a world that looked like nothing was possible except for the continued slavery of his people. But he, he rose against the Pharaoh out of faith. Faith, that, faith in the world that God was going to be making for his people. By faith, Moses then led the people through the wilderness for 40 years, surviving off the food that God had promised them, that God provided them, and then finally coming to a land of their own, which God had promised. And though he does not have time to fully tell their stories, the preacher makes mention of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who did Remar remarkable things, unexpected things that they might not have otherwise done or, ever, or have, even had the thought to attempt were it not for the reality of faith moving in them to live a life of service, of a reality that was not yet evident, but by the promises of God was still certain to happen. They lived a life of, in the reality of faith faith, to live in service of a reality that was not yet evident. But by the promises of God, it was certain to happen. You see, having faith in God means not only believing that God exists, it means that your life is changed by God. And, it, it, and, and, and at the most basic extent, it doesn't require any effort on your part. God has reached into you, and by God coming to you in faith, God changes the the nature of your existence, that first change, the change on which all other future changes are based. It's the change that makes all the future changes possible. Your existence becomes fundamentally different when you come to faith. Who you are changes because God is with you in a real, tangible way that cannot be explained or proven but yet you know, even if you know in the midst of doubt, that God exists and is with you. And because you are changed, God moves you to act to change the world in faith. To, to bring that reality that is now present in you and change the reality of the world to better reflect that reality of faith. Just as Abraham was moved to leave his home by faith and trust God to bring him and Sarah to an unlikely future, just as Moses was led to defy his people's slave masters and bring his people to freedom, just as the great and small throughout Scripture lived by faith and in service of the kingdom of God, 
to create by their actions a world that is more loving, more just, more united, and knowing the freeing truth of the grace of God. That world does not yet exist. That, that, that world that is dominated by, by love, by justice, by unity, by, by, by knowing truly, knowing God, that does not yet exist. And it won't exist until Jesus returns. But that's not a reason to give up. It's not a reason to choose to live in accordance with the world that is not ruled by the, by the principles of the kingdom of heaven. We should never succumb to the violent, exploitative, greedy, soul-destroying ways of the world as it is. Now, th these individuals, these, these pillars of faith that the preacher speaks of, they did what they did in defiance of the way that the world was. They were changed by the fact that God was in them, and so their choices, their actions reflected the kingdom of God, not the world around them. Faith is the very being of the hoped-for future. It's a little bit of that kingdom of God that enters into the world in us. So how will you add your name to that list of faithful individuals who act, who acted with transformed hearts to then transform the world? What do you have to give that defies the way that things are in favor of the way that God promises they will be? What gift has God blessed you with that you can give to God's service and, and show God's love to the world? In this season where we think about being good stewards of what God has given us, constantly reflect on what you have to give and where God is moving you to do it. Remember that by faith all things are possible, and that faith isn't just sheer force of will or determination. That faith is the presence of God in you. So when you choose to step out and change the world, you are acting in accordance with your changed character. And you are following God, not following our own will, but following the will of God. May it be so this day and always. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in a portion of a brief statement of faith, a confession of the Presbyterian Church USA. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit everywhere, the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. Amen. Now let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in them. Let us pray. Reforming God, our world needs you. We have wandered so far from your ways and turned away from your commands. War, violence, hatred, and greed prevail. So we ask that you grant us peace, hope, love, and courage so that we can be the people that you created us to be in this world. Our nation needs you. Politics and fear divide us and drive us to our separate corners even though we are called to love our enemies and to do good to those who curse us and despise us. Lord of love, we ask that you remind and empower us to be people of hope and reconciliation who stand up for righteousness, justice, and peace. Our church, your church, needs you. We don't know your word well enough to teach it to our children. We don't read your word enough to draw on it during our time of need. So we ask that you prompt us to imbibe in the bread of life and the living water that are found in your word and in you. Remind us that you are the source of all that we need, and then send us to be your church in the world, all the time, everywhere. We need you. Each of us needs you. Please remind us that you hear our prayers and you answer them. Invite us again and again to draw near to you as you draw near to us. 
and hear us as we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Trusting in the generous grace and guidance of God who has led us throughout the ages, now we now give generously to the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ in the world. Give of your possessions, give of your, of your prayers, of your kind words, your, your convicting words, and your actions that help show love and show the reality of God's kingdom to the world. Let us now take a moment to pray and rededicate ourselves to God. Gracious and generous God, please accept these gifts that we have brought. May these offerings serve to draw others to love, honor, and serve you. Multiply these tithes and offerings, Holy One, and use them for the edification of your people all around the world, all for love's sake. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, go out knowing the radical, amazing truth of the reality that faith brings, that you are changed at a fundamental level, and so live in that change. Live in that faith. Let that faith rule your entire life. Continue to go back to Scripture, to consult Scripture, to make sure that we are following God and not merely following our own desires. But go out knowing the power that resides in you through faith. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and give you grace. Grace not to sell yourself short, but grace to risk something big for something good. Grace enough to know the world is now too small for anything but the truth and too terrified for anything but love. God, take your minds and think through them. God, take your lips and speak through them. God, take your hands and work through them. God, take your hearts and set them on fire. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm -hmm.